And so, first question that we've got here is, if you've been diagnosed with crumbling of the spine, how do you stop it? If you've been diagnosed with crumbling of the spine, how do you stop it? And before we lead into the questions, I think it goes back to something that Graham and Chris touched on at the beginning um, about, you know, are you are you damaging your spine further or are you damaging a certain part of your body when you move or when you do exercise? And um, so I think it leads well into that uh, thing that obviously Graham discussed. So yeah, crumbling spine. Uh, if I'm completely honest, I don't think. I've worked as a physiologist for oh, coming up to 10 years now, and I'm being really honest, I don't think I've ever seen a crumbling spine. I've, I've never seen a crumbling spine, and I think in terms of when people are, if that's something what you've been told, I think in my mindset, you, I, I would probably ask for a second opinion and perhaps sort of see, perhaps an update, an updated healthcare professional would maybe look at your scan with you and talk through it with you normally. Because if you've been told off right, it's like it's like what my Chris was saying before. This is just sort of like a really normal finding. So I would, if that's on what you've been told, I think you, I think it's review of a healthcare professional, review your scan with you, and I'm I'm sure that that is not something what you can see on the scan. I don't know if you would agree with yeah, that, Chris. I agree. I think from the from the medical perspective, we often um, we think of things like osteoporosis as uh, as a crumbling kind of or it's often depicted as a crumbling condition. And generally, I mean, osteoporosis is a condition that demineralizes bone. We know that bone needs minerals in it, like calcium, and also kind of softer elements to kind of give it its strength, but also its kind of structure. Osteoporosis means that there's a demineralization progressively over time, and it's normal to get a degree of, of demineralization. Um, generally, when in particularly in, in women past the menopause, we lose about 1% of our mineralization every year. And that's normal. And in blokes, generally, we tend to lose mineralization as time goes on as well. And um, so, I've, I'm with Graham, actually, I've never encountered anybody with a crumbling spine. I've seen somebody who's got an osteoporotic spine. But actually, the jury, uh, when you look at the evidence, the jury's out as to whether osteoporosis is something that causes pain. Because when we think about this for a sec, we've got a lot of nerve fibers that are in our structure. And when we have osteoporosis, it's not that these nerve fibers are in any shape or form um, destroyed. We didn't realize both. The nerve fibers are still there. They, um, they, kind of, they still send the same messages. Sure, if we've got a vertebra that's demineralized to the point that it started to crack, and that's again something that is very common. <coughs> we know in acute inflammatory kind of conditions where we've got a fracture, and um, that causes pain, those little micro fractures, that can cause pain because of the inflammatory response we talked about before. But in terms of crumbling back, yeah, I, I, I don't see crumbling backs. We talk about it, and it's sometimes said off the cuff, and it has been for 20 years or so, but I don't, I, I don't kind of subscribe to that. Thank you. Um, I think it, we're going to one of the other questions as well that we received, but we're not all included in, in there, but I guess it kind of covers the similar sort of topic about um, somebody had mentioned something about uh, if they've um, if they've got like a, if they've been told like you know, like slip discs and these kinds of things or models that they often see you know, like when they go into doctor surgery and these kind of things they see they see a, a, a sort of a, a picture of a, a spine or a model of a spine with a slip disc you know hanging out and you think oh that's the cause of you know of my pain. So I think it does relate to that also. So that's, uh, that's good. And um, the next question is: uh, Is there a publicly accessible medium where we could signpost employers, family and friends, social workers, etc., to increase awareness and understanding of the information shared here today? Yeah, I think I mean the public sites. The, I mean the professional bodies that kind of cover pain. There's a couple in the UK. One's called the Faculty of Pain Medicine. The other one's the British Pain Society. Um, there's international ones, there's one called the International Association for the Study of Pain, and there's another one called EFIC, European Federation of International Chapters, that's what it stands for. But, but basically, there's a lot of kind of professional groups that talk about pain, and there's lots of useful information on their websites. Um, so, so yeah, have a, have a kind of Google on that if, uh, if that's all. Yeah. Yeah. Well, there's more about something for the taming the beast. Yeah, there's, there's lots of work by really up to date physiotherapists. So you might have heard of Lauren Mosley and his group. He's got a website called Body and Mind, and I think they're sort of 
doing a similar thing what we're doing here today, look, looking at pain a little bit differently and sort of trying to, yeah, change the way we're sort of moving forwards because the old body like we've talked about today is not working. So that's a really good side, body and mind. You type in Lauren and Mosley. Um, yeah, and that's a really good and yeah, the NOI group, and that's one of the groups he's affi- affiliated to as well. Also, from a patient's perspective, there's something called the pain toolkit. Um, so if you Google that, it comes up with kind of, uh, you know, kind of self-management plans and stuff like that. It doesn't go so much into the neuro side, I think, but it's, it does go into the kind of uh, goal setting and, and, and stuff like that side. And I think just talking about before, we said we'll try and post some of the answers to these questions. We'll, we'll get a list of these websites as well and pop them there, on there as well. Um, yeah, of course. Pain clinics, they have lo- you have loads of information, don't you? Yeah. And you're able to sign those people to... Yeah, yeah. So, ask these guys as well. <laughs> Thank you. Um, what happens dealing with pain and the after effects the day after uh, activity? For example, what about fatigue? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think when you're in pain, I think it's that... I'm not going to exercise because I know how I'll feel the days afterwards. And I think when we look at the literature, it tends to talk about a real graded approach to sort of exposure back into exercise to starting off at sort of very small levels and building it up. But unfortunately, sometimes you'll see you've sort of dipped into it, you don't know how your body's going to respond. So it is an element of trial and error. But generally, the research suggests sort of starting off really slowly and building it up. And I think as part of our programs are really interesting, you see that. We have a pain management program where individuals do a nine week program. And as part of the program, they do exercise, and you see over the nine weeks how they're able to sort of gradually, gradually increase their exercise tolerance and able to increase the function. But again, I think, like I was talking about before, there's, there's an element of real courage to sort of take that first step and say, actually, there's something here, why don't we improve my function? And again, so it's normally that great approach is the best way forward. I think there's a lot of research going on, particularly now the mechanisms for fatigue associated with pain and also fatigue in its own right. Um, and the, yeah, it's huge, the amount of research. The immunological system is clearly uh, has a significant role to play. But I think at this point in time, we're not yet at the point where technology will, is able to help us in terms of a treatment or a kind of a, a drug for this. But there's massive research going on, lots of promising stuff. And lots of promising approaches, particularly with novel compounds managing uh, managing fatigue. So I think it is a little bit of watch this space. It's not there yet, but we know the fatigue associated with pain and, and fatigue associated with well uh, the mechanism around chronic fatigue. And um, yeah, that, that's uh, that's very very hot at the moment in the scientific research. Okay. And um, the next one uh, says, how do I access the pain management clinicians when my doctor won't refer me to the pain clinic? Nobody wants to answer. I think um, some of it is. Do you want to say something? Okay. Um, has anybody else found that and found success? Put your hand up. No. Okay. Um, yeah. Basically, I think. Um, plugging away. I mean, change doctor. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think you know. For, for me, managing. You know, I think for all of us, managing pain is you know it's 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 all consuming. And I think if you've got a good team of people around you to help you manage, then that's brilliant. If you don't have a good team of people around you, then it's kind of recognizing who you need within your team and a, a GP who is you've got a good relationship with. And that's sometimes difficult to get. Again, as I'm talking as a previous GP, it is quite challenging, particularly given you know, kind of how we work now in primary care. But, um, but yeah, get hold of a good GP and um, try and find one. And that way, you know, you can build a relationship. Um, the other idea I had was, um, I think we have referral criteria on our website, or we did once upon a time. But it's being armed, isn't it, with knowledge and saying, look, this is the referral criteria for this team. This is how I feel I fit these, you know, this criteria. And, and being your own advocate sometimes, taking someone else in with you maybe, or like 
Chris says in not so many words, think about changing the doctor. <laughs> in not so many words. <laughs> Now get to the clinic by referring to self-in. If that was wrong about the doctor, is that something that would be um, good bearing to prove for? Yeah, I don't know if people heard that on the back. It was about self-referral, I think. Um, Just, I've seen it in some other clinics. Yeah, yeah I think um, it's something that's been worked on and um, other services um, within this locality, or sorry, not within this locality, but up in Preston, and there's kind of a, there's a musculoskeletal sales. They do offer elements of self-referral in, into that service, but the amount of information that's required for, if you're looking at a complex condition like persistent pain, that's tricky to initiate self-referral because there's a lot of information you need about medication, about previous illness, about you know lots of different things. And so self-referral, I think we probably need to think carefully about how we do. I certainly think it's a, you know it's something that we should be looking at in the future, but. Um, but yeah, we just, I guess our referral systems at the moment are just not quite there. But I think it's certainly something we should be looking at. Okay. Um, I guess the next one probably um, for me uh, is uh, medication related. Um, and it's quite surprising actually, out of all the questions we got, there's probably three which were directly medication related. So I guess it does show how far people are on, uh, along they are on their journey basically. because. Um, often people realise after trying so many medications for so many years and they come to that stage where they realise that actually these medications might not be helping me. Um, so this question particularly asks about the use of Tramadol and the use of Naproxen uh, for long periods of time uh, to manage pain. Um, do they have any long-lasting effects on your body or well-being? Um, and I guess we could sort of generalise this question as well and not just specific to Tramadol and Naproxen. Um, so tr Tramadol is, is like a weak opioid and the proxin is an anti-inflammatory. There's probably many of you in this room who have either been on it at some point or know somebody that, that's been on it. Um, and the biggest thing like with the proxin, for example, and anti-inflammatory that people tend to uh, talk about is the stomach, the inflammation of the stomach or the bleeding, the risk of the bleeding that it can cause. Um, but there are other you know, issues and other long-term effects. One consultant that I used to work with uh, in, in a hospital setting used to say that it's like uh, naproxen or NSAIDs, which are the anti-inflammatories, is basically the devil's drug, because they said that the amount of patients that they see, especially in the elderly population, who take these anti-inflammatories and it affects the kidney function, and that en ends up causing them to, to have an acute kidney injury, what we call, and they will be admitted to hospital. So, um, so yes, in short, obviously medication as a side effect can cause uh, uh, sort of a, a long-lasting impact on your body, Sometimes they're reversible, so when you stop the medication, they, these things subside. But sometimes they can have a long-lasting effect as well uh, on the body. And uh, I think Chris talked about opioids briefly in, in his uh, talk to say where opioids fit into the whole mechanism uh, of pain and, and why we know that the evidence doesn't point towards opioids. Um, so, so yeah, so there are obviously the disadvantages of, of using medications, and there can be long-term impacts of that. Um, and that's why uh, it's important. And mine also sort of comes into there as well, but also the other clinicians flagging that up and, and having these discussions that um, making sure that the medication that patients are using, they're using it in a safe way um, and they're using it uh, at an optimal dose and they're using it at the right time, etc. Et so there are ways of mitigating these kinds of effects, and that's why it's so important because. Patients like yourselves are, are basically very uh, experienced and they're professional patients, basically. You, you might be on these medications for years, and me as a clinician, I might have told patients about these medications, but I might not have taken it myself. So as far as taking the medication is concerned, you might be more experienced than I might be, uh, or like Chris might be, or some of the other clinicians in the team. So you've got a lot of experience, and that sometimes, as years go on, you, try, you tend to get into positions where you experiencing or experimenting, sorry, with medication, you're taking things that are not necessarily the right way of doing it. So um, to make sure that it's done in a safe manner and, in, and the dosing is optimum, uh, then we, uh, we will try, sort of try and manage it in that sense. Um, one for Chris and maybe um, 
brain, the difference between spondylosis and arthritis. <laughs> um, spondylosis is a term that has been used for years, actually, and it's, it's kind of more of a reflection of changes that you see on an x-ray. So if you were to um, look at somebody's neck on a, on a film and they had arthritic change, maybe bits of extra bone that have grown on them because again that's a normal response or body remoulds and remodels as time goes on. So if you x-rayed anybody's neck at the age of 20, then at 30, then at 40, then at 50, you'd see changes in the neck and you would see um, bones that are kind of different, slightly different sizes or different shapes. And that's the body's response to ongoing kind of mechanical stress that's placed upon it. And again, that's normal. So spondylosis basically is a description of those changes. And as Graham alluded to, I think, earlier, he um, made a really important point that there's been many studies now that have shown that the amount of change on an x-ray can't be equated to the amount of pain somebody's in. So there can be lots of change on an x-ray and you don't have pain. Well, it can be very minimal change and people have terrible pain. So we can't conclude that spondylosis is um, kind of that x-ray appearance is something that's painful. So spondylosis basically is a radiological term that the kind of x-ray doctors use to describe change as the bones have remodeled. Osteoarthritis is kind of the regenerative process that we see in joints where the immune system looks at tiny little microtraumas that have occurred and tries to repair them. Sometimes an osteoarthritic joint looks a bit like the surface of the moon if it's had loads and loads of repairs. But it's the body remoulding and it's the body kind of bolstering what it's got. We used to kind of think of osteoarthritis as a degenerative condition. We've really started to rethink in the last 10 years, 15 years, as there's more evidence, that this is a regenerative condition, not a degenerative condition. I don't know if you're going to work that. <coughs> Thank you. Um, if you have nerve damage from a tumour in the spinal cord, how do you control the pain in the nerves from that, i.e. like electric shock for you? Yeah. Um, again, this is quite a specific question really about, um, about neurological damage, I guess, because if there's something like a spinal tumour that's, um, that's been there, then that can... Uh, like any tumours that can damage tissue around them, depending on what kind of tumour it is, they can cause compressive effects on the nervous system or on nerves. And that compressive effect can irritate a nerve. And so it may be that perhaps the tumour has been removed from somewhere and you're left, or the, what can be left is the kind of, um, I guess the way I would think about this is the software problem afterwards and of the hardware the tumour has been removed, but the processing now has cha changed within the central nervous system. So particularly we're talking about spinal cord tumours now. Um, if you've got something removed there, then that can continually have irritated the nervous system. So the processing is different, and it may become much more sensitised. And I guess that becomes really the realm of what we were talking about before, about how the brain then processes all of that sensory information, and the different strategies. We may gain 1% from doing this, we may gain 3% from doing that. Medication may give, you know, varying amounts of percent, but it's a kind of a, a collective, it's like having a toolbox. Lots of different things will give different um, contributions towards managing pain. So it's not an easy answer, really. And, and, and sometimes what we, we focus on in the clinic is trying to kind of focus initially diagnostically what actually is the mechanism here. Is some of this central nervous system change, is some peripheral nervous system change, is some of the pain actually as a consequence of we're moving differently. And that might be contributing to our pain. So it's about drilling some of those things down. Graham, is anybody you want to um, pick up anything there? I, I suppose, from what Chris is talking about, once the pain has then gone on for a period of time, what's happening in the nervous system would be like the stuff we've talked about today. So the management, be, it's about looking at things what is modifiable in your life. And I think it's going back. Yeah, I think it's about changing the nervous system and going back to the way we've things we talked about really do because that's the stuff that we can change the stuff that's in the body often we can't change that structure but there's other stuff that we can change and the cumulative effect you know we sort of get some benefits I was just thinking about um, inviting the person to think about the times when those sensations are there those pains are there but they're less noticeable you know because often when people are experiencing like that, it can feel like it's happening all the time to the same intensity, you know, and the more you think about it, the more worked up you get, and then the more worked up you feel about the pain, and, and you know, all these kind of same brain areas are from, from firing off. But actually, 
um, when we invite people to look at times when it's it's less noticeable and more in the background, um, sometimes we can find interesting things out about what helps them to live better. And also, I was thinking about the literature about the mindfulness stuff and how um, sometimes associating more of a calm, relaxed response with a painful stimulus, you, you can't change the sensation of the pain, but you can change how you react to the pain to a degree, and that's what those studies Marx was, was talking about. So there might be some mileage and stuff like that. Last, last question, and it ties in a little bit with the with the previous one. Um, so taking it right back to the beginning, uh, the analogy that Chris brought up, thinking of the hammer and the thumb, thumb scenario, putting the thumb under a cold, cold tap to make it feel better. What can someone with fibromyalgia do when all the, all the families of drugs and all the types of drugs haven't helped, and every day you, you're consumed with pain? I have lots of things I'm interested in. But the pain doesn't decrease and eventually stops me enjoying activities. Uh, I had a broken cervical vertebrae at age uh, 11, 12. Could this have been the trigger? What was the last bit again? Uh, I, I, have a broken, uh, I have a broken cervical vertebrae at age 11 to 12. Could this have been the trigger? Um, there is. Um, there is a kind of a correlation between people who've had painful stimulus previously and it's almost like there's a kind of the nervous system has been primed in some way and then when something else comes along then that can be another kind of precipitant towards pain or it may be that it doesn't actually have to have had a mechanism and we know that particularly when we are looking at or when, when there's a condition like fibromyalgia that isn't injury related it's not as a consequence generally of physical injury although that can kind of that can kind of make things worse but we know that the mechanisms some of the mechanisms we don't fully understand fibromyalgia as the reality but some of the mechanisms in fibromyalgia really demonstrate high levels of central sensitization which means that the brain is as we've been talking about tonight the brain is quite kind of um quite active and it struggles to switch off in some of the key areas that kind of um that are responsible for managing pain so um i think the, the the challenge, I guess, really is is looking at pain management strategies as a toolbox. As I said, really, it's not about a single thing that will um, that will get rid of the pain or will stop the pain. This is pain of central origin. So, therefore, a lot of the central things that we've been talking about about our, um, about kind of mindfulness strategies, about kind of how we move, how we desensitize our nervous system to an extent with, with movement. Those are going to be really important things. And again, all of the stuff. Um, all the things that Becky has been touching on, those are really important cognitive factors. Like we said, the sensory system and all the cognitive factors are kind of mixed together, and that's what creates and, and contributes towards a pain experience. So managing managing those things really. Thank you. Sorry, we've just got the, the message from Mark. So I think that uh, wraps up uh, the questions that we, we'd selected out. But as I said before, um, there's quite a lot going on as well, and hopefully we'll try and get some good analysis. Um, so if you uh, have a look at our website, um, and, uh, and hopefully we'll be able to get some analysis to